Now, today, I want to show you a series of, of images and, and to talk about this, uh, talk about them, um, mostly about Sikhs uh, in the Gallipoli campaign. Um, I don't want to talk about strategy or tactics, so there won't be any maps with, with many arrows on them, um, but I do want to talk about the experience of Gallipoli for Indian and especially Sikh soldiers and uh, about the memory of the Gallipoli campaign, which we've already admitted is a little imperfect. Um, I have a very strong commitment to doing what you're doing today, that is to say, to involve communities in history. Uh, and I'll, again, have a little bit to say about the place of family stories in my research. Now, I have about 40 slides, so by my calculation, that gives me about one every minute for the next 40 minutes, and then we'll have time for some discussion. So you won't get a lot uh, of detail, but you will get a lot. This is the book that uh, the research will produce. It'll be published, as I say, next year. It's called Die in Battle, Do Not Despair, the Indians on Gallipoli, 1915. The title comes from a, a Gurkha uh, song, but the chapter titles also come from the writings of Muslim and Sikh and Hindu and Gurkha soldiers on Gallipoli. So it, uh, it, it tries to reflect the ideas, the mentality, the feeling of those involved. I want to talk a bit, to begin with, about the reputation that Sikh troops enjoyed through the British Empire. This is a cartoon from an Australian newspaper. You can see that the, um, the caption says, a thin pretense. A German spy in disguise joined the Indian troops. He accompanied them to Marseille, where he was detected and arrested. A quotation supposedly from a French newspaper. And of course, there's the, the squat little German pretending to be one of the big manly Sikhs. So the Sikhs already had a reputation throughout the empire as being martial, manly, impressive soldiers. And that is something that runs right through the Gallipoli campaign. Amandeep gave us a very good context for the, the bigger picture of the war earlier today, and he, he mentioned the defense of the Suez Canal. Here are Punjabi soldiers who are involved in the, defeating that Turkish incursion against the, the, the Suez Canal. And as he mentioned, they included Sikh soldiers, and particularly the 14th Sikhs. The 14th Sikhs were the only Sikh infantry regiment to be sent to Gallipoli, although there were other Sikhs, as I'll mention. Uh, and here they are, or, or rather, this is the, the, uh, the ac action in which the Sikhs were involved in defeating that Turkish attack in uh, January and February 1915. Just a quick uh, summary of, of the Indian force that went to Gallipoli. In July 1915, it was named Force G, uh, G for Gallipoli, of course, uh, and it comprised the 7th Mountain Artillery Brigade, which was a half Punjabi Muslim and half Sikh, uh, the main Indian formation on Gallipoli was the 29th Indian Infantry Brigade, and as you can see, it included by the end of the campaign six battalions or part battalions, including, as I've mentioned, the 14th Ferozpur Sikhs, uh, but also, by the end of the campaign, four Gurkha battalions, and, and also later on, as I'll mention in a moment, the 1st Rajinja Patiala Infantry. Now, this is remarkable, because this is the... F I, I'm claiming, and I'm glad to be corrected, the first time that an Indian Army Brigade has gone to war, except for the ones on the canal in Egypt, without a British battalion being a part of the brigade. So it's, one of its claims to fame is, is that it's an all-Indian Army Indian Brigade. Um, as you can see, it's mostly Gurkha, and I'll be happy to talk about why it's mostly Gurkha another time, or later on. Um, but it includes the 14th Ferozpur Sikhs, and there are two men of the 14th Ferozpur Sikhs in the trenches of Gallipoli. I should also say, though, that there is a very large supply and transport contingent on Gallipoli, which again I'll talk about presently, and there are also medical units. And there are Sikhs in all of these uh, parts of the force, in the artillery, in the infantry, in supply and transport, and in the medical units. So although the, Sikhs, the Sikh infantry is the mainstay of the Sikh experience of Gallipoli, uh, they're all through the, the, uh, the force. First of all, let me talk about the mountain gunners. Now, this is really important because the mountain gunners, as you see here uh, on the right, the mountain gunners landed on Gallipoli on the morning of the 25th of April, 1915, alongside the Australians. Uh, Amandeep invited me to say a word about the, the controversy that's running in South Australia at the moment, and I'm very happy to do this. Uh, the Anzac Day uh, is, is the day of national commemoration of war in Australia. And in each capital city, and indeed in many towns and other communities, the main way in which Anzac Day is marked is by a march, a parade of war veterans and others through the streets to go to a commemorative service. The march is generally controlled by what's called the Returned and Services League, which is a, a, a veterans association. In South Australia, in the capital city Adelaide, the RSL committee that controls the march has 
denied permission to a group of Indian ex-army officers to march on Anzac Day. Now, these officers want to march on Anzac Day to remember this very event, that is to say, the landing on Gallipoli by Indians alongside Australians on the very day in which they commemorate war. And they're being denied that, which I regard as absolutely outrageous. And I've, um, I've, I've spoken on, in various forums to, to oppose it. Um, just today on the train coming here, I, was, I remembered that there was a, a South Australian school teacher on Gallipoli <clears throat> who was a, a field ambulance man. And he was so impressed by his Indian uh, c uh, colleagues in, uh, in the Indian field ambulance that he wrote to the Secretary of State for India, Austin Chamberlain, and wrote about his admiration for those grand and game soldiers of India, he said. And he promised that the, the common prejudice in Australia against Indians, which was certainly a fact in a, a deeply racist society, he said, despite that prejudice, Australians would extend an open hand of binding friendship whenever we meet. Well, sadly, the RSL in South Australia doesn't know about that, so I'm going to tell them. Um, here are members of the Mountain Artillery. Uh, as I say, a mixture of Punjabi Muslims, Sikhs, uh, a few others. Uh, and the Mountain Artillery was the mainstay of the defence of Anzac through the initial days of the landing. And they stayed as part of the Anzac force in the Anzac battlefield for the rest of the campaign. They were mule-mounted mountain artillery so that the gun detachments carried the mules, uh, the guns and the ammunition on, on mules. And here you see them unlimbering on a, a ridge in the early days of the Gallipoli campaign. And they served alongside the Australians for the entire campaign. The main infantry uh, on Gallipoli, the main Indian infantry as opposed to Gurkha, was the 14th Sikhs. And here's a wonderful photograph from the New Zealand uh, Alexander Turnbull Library in Wellington. Material on Sikhs on Gallipoli turns up in archives all over the world, in, in Britain, in New Zealand, in Australia, uh, and, and of course in India. Uh, and I'm fortunate to have been able to, to, to do a great deal of, of gathering for this project, and these are only some of the images. Uh, you might think that with a, a, a bit of an out-of-the-way campaign like Gallipoli, you'd be scrabbling for sources, and that's not the case. There is, in fact, an abundance of sources, so many, in fact, that I think there's, there's at least two more books to be written about Indians on Gallipoli. Uh, one on medical aspects and one on supply and transport, which, again, I'll say a bit more about. But this is the 14th Ferozpur Sikhs. You can date this almost exactly. Uh, you'll see that those men are wearing white armbands. That was donned only for the August offensive. Uh, and this is at the very opening of the August offensive. And I believe this is the, the half, the uh, two double companies of the 14th Sikhs were delayed by bad weather from landing on the 6th of, of August. And they ended up landing on the 7th of August. And I think this is them who are lined up uh, near Anzac Cove, right next door to the Turkish prisoner of war compound on Anzac. So they're men who are about to go into the, the most uh, demanding, the most critical, the most dramatic uh, attack on the Gallipoli Peninsula. And sadly, many of those men will lose their lives over the succeeding several days. This is, but before that, uh, before the August offensive, as you very well know, I'm sure, the Indians served at, at Cape Helles, the southern part of the peninsula, around Gully Ravine. This is a, a shot of Gully Ravine in 1915. It's a, a gully that goes for about two miles parallel to the coast, and it was the main theatre for the Indian Brigade for the two months that it served at Cape Helles between May and early July. And the 14 Sikhs attacked up this ravine on the, the 4th of June. Uh, it's the largest and most costly action in, in that. This is a drawing of depicting Sikh troops attacking the Turks. It comes from one of the Sikh uh, battalion histories. And the losses that, that this attack uh, imposed on the 14th Sikhs were horrendous. Uh, they went into battle with 15 British officers, and that included their Parsi medical officer in the Indian Army's weird racial terminology, 13 Indian officers, and 450 sepoys. And at the end of the day, 12 of those British officers were killed, 11 of the 13 Indian officers were killed, and 371 of the 450 Indian sepoys were killed. So they, the battalion incurred 80% losses, killed and wounded, 80% losses in that one day. And as you would expect, when word of that reached the Punjab, um, it caused a deep impact in, in the Punjab. And as you well know better than I, the, the Punjab was, was somewhat ambivalent about its support for the war effort. And uh, paradoxically, the losses that the 14 Sikhs uh, suffered in that attack on the 4th of June galvanized Sikh opinion. And after that, there was never a shortage of Sikh recruits. And as Amandeep mentioned, the uh, a number of Sikhs enlisting for the Indian Army 
essentially voluntary through the war was enormous, and, and it was precipitated, galvanized, um, brought to, to fruition by the losses that they, the Sikhs lost in this, what was regarded as a, a tragic but heroic attack. It, it was of no military consequence at all. The, the line barely moved, um, but it had, other, it had more profound effects than just the tactical effects. And this is one reason for the 14th Sikh's quality as an infantry battalion. These are three of its Indian officers, uh, Subadars or Jemadars. As you can see from their, their, they fit exactly the stereotype of the Sikh, tall, manly, imposing. These men, they're, they're reasonably old, they're probably in their 40s, and that means that they've got 20 odd years of military service behind them, and it's the, the sheer quality of their soldierly uh, efficiency, their discipline, their, their uh, capacity to, to lead and command that explains to a large extent the quality of the 14th Sikhs on Gallipoli. Because of the losses of the 4th of June, the 14th Sikhs for about uh, a couple of months was virtually rendered ineffective. It had so few men. And as Amandeep mentioned, the reserve, the reinforcement system in the Indian Army was such that, that it, was, it was essential that men of the same class, Jat Sikhs in this case, should be brought from India and sent to the front at Gallipoli. And you couldn't do that quickly, partly because of the distance, partly because it took time to train even wartime volunteers. So the British authorities in Egypt and in Gallipoli, who were running Force G, cast around for other options. And one was, was that they would, uh, if you like, dilute the 14 Sikhs, which was one of the, the few entirely Sikh regiments. It wasn't a mixture of Punjabi Muslims and Dogras and so on. It was entirely Jat Sikh. So they, 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 they had limited options to reinforce this regiment. They remembered, though, that the Maharaja of Patiala's Rajendra infantry was in Egypt. And you saw photographs of the Maharaja of Patiala in Egypt later in the war. And his own infantry regiment was on, in Egypt at the time. Exactly the same composition. Not only the same type of men, but men from exactly the same area. They were all recruited from Patiala, Ferozpur, as you know, neighboring districts in the Punjab. And so from July, one double company of the Patialas arrived and went into the August offensive with the, with the 14th Ferozpur Sikhs. And then in September, a second double company from the Patialas arrived. And that meant that the, there were, they, they reinforced the number of Sikhs, and it meant that the Sikh presence on Gallipoli continued. Even though the 14th Sikhs had been very severely mauled in that battle on the 4th of June, the, there were many more Sikhs who came to support them. Uh, and the, uh, the 14th Sikhs retained those Patialas right through the rest of the campaign. And here are some of the Patiala troops. These, they were state troops. They were troops personally um, commanded by the Maharaja of Patiala, uh, equipped virtually identically and uniformed virtually identically along with, with the British Indian Army troops uh, and, and almost indistinguishable from, for, from Ferozpur Sikhs. Um, the, the state troops were regarded as either a joke or as of dubious quality by British military authorities in India, but not the Patialas. The, the, uh, the Indian Army conducted a review, a report of its uh, state forces just before the war, and it described the Patialas as being the best of the Indian state troops. So they were regarded as being of the same quality as the Ferozpur Sikhs. And the Ferozpur Sikhs, in fact, were regarded as one of the elite regiments of the Indian Army. So these men were not by no means a joke, and they shared the, uh, the hardships, the privations of the campaign on Gallipoli and the losses for the rest of the campaign. I mentioned that there was a large Indian supply and transport force on Gallipoli, uh, and I mean large. It was not a transport force just intended to support that one Indian infantry brigade and the one artillery brigade. In fact, the Indian supply and transport mule trains supplied and sustained the entire British and Anzac force at Anzac, and largely the British force at, at Cape Helles, and also the, the later force which arrived at Suvla. I'll show you a map in a minute. I should have showed you the map sooner, but you'll figure out where these places are. The point is there were thousands of mules and thousands of muleteers and drivers, like this man. He's a, a, a Muslim, of course, but there were many Sikh muleteers in the force. Whoops. Um, this is one of the, the joys of uh, in researching the Indian experience of Gallipoli has been that the, as I say, the, the, the sources are abundant, and the sources are not just documents, but they are works of art, drawings. These are drawings done by an Australian light horse officer, Leslie Hall, who was the brother-in-law of one of the, Indian, the British Indian officers who was commanding one of the mule trains. So Leslie had a bit to do with Alexander Heber, the mule train officer, 
and, and so had a bit to do with his men as well. And so in the State Library of New South Wales in Sydney, there, was a, 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 there are pages of, of this sketchbook in which he, he sketched uh, Indian muleteers, and some of them Sikh, some of them Punjabi Muslims, uh, in Gallipoli. So looking after the goats, which they kept in order to feed, so they had live uh, fresh meat. Uh, the mules, of course, which are absolutely an essential part of the Anzac landscape. Lots of photographs of Gallipoli show mules in the background, all of whom were, were, were run by Indian muleteers. And even on the right there, uh, a, a muleteer who's gone up to Walker's Ridge. Walker's Ridge was one of the very high frontline positions in the Anzac front line. And he's having a go at the Turks using a periscope rifle. So although he's a, a muleteer, he's also having a pot at the, at the Turks. Uh, this is a depiction of one of the mule camps. There are several mule gullies. The big one is, if you, if you know the landscape of Anzac, and I may even have a photograph of it, there's a, a very tall feature called the Sphinx, and immediately below the Sphinx is a, a winding gully which is slightly protected from Turkish shell fire, and this is the seaward end of it, uh, and that's the, the outside of Mule Gully. And again, there are literally thousands of mules uh, used on Gallipoli carrying those boxes of supplies, ammunition and water up to the front line and bringing... Uh, uh, or coming back empty, in fact, uh, but still running the gamut of Turkish shell fire and shrapnel. Oh, this is it, yes. This is Mule Gully, as I saw it the last week, a week today, on Gallipoli. Uh, the Sphinx is the feature, very high feature on the left, and the very deep green gully is Mule Gully today. Uh, in 1915, that was scooped out and was, was the place where literally hundreds of mules was, were, were kept and at the base of the, of the mouth of the gully, there were piles of, of boxes and, and stores to try and provide a barrier against Turkish shell fire. But Turkish shells would, would drop into the, into the gully and kill uh, dozens of mules. So there were, there were thousands of mules, mules killed on Gallipoli, and the disposal of their bodies was a big problem. One of the things they did was to tow them out to sea and hope that they'd sink. Uh, and there were lots of reports of submarines. In fact, they were, they were mules' hoofs sticking out of the water. Uh, Anyway, that's Mule Gully. Just a reminder that there are four battalions, eventually four battalions of Gurkhas on Gallipoli, and this is the second 10th Gurkhas in that fight for Sari Bayir, the, the climax of the August offensive. And I won't say anything more about, about Gurkhas because this, our focus today is Punjabis and especially Sikhs. But uh, just to remind you that there were Gurkhas on Gallipoli and the, the bulk of uh, Indian troops, there were 16,000 Indian troops on Gallipoli, they say troops of the Indian army. About 3,000 of them were Sikhs, and there were 1,600 Indian troops killed on Gallipoli, and about 300 of them were Sikhs. So we're talking about a fifth of the force being Sikh. Um, just a word about sources, because it's, uh, in, the Indian part in Gallipoli has been astonishingly neglected over the years. Uh, it's nearly 100 years, and there has been no book published on this subject since the battalion histories were published, and the last battalion history was, I think, published in 1948, of the, the 14th Sikhs. So it's been a long time since anyone's done anything on the Indian part on Gallipoli. Uh, and, that's, and one reason for that is that the sources, although they're abundant, they're scattered all over the world, including in Turkey, because one of the sources for this project is the landscape of Gallipoli. And this is looking over the fields in the northern part of Anzac, uh, a, a, a trench that used to be called Sikh Walk, in late 1915. You cannot see the trench anymore. The trench has been, like virtually all trenches on Gallipoli, has been almost entirely obliterated. But the Sikhs were there, and there are two trenches, one at Hellas and one at Anzac, called Sikh, to, as a reminder that they were there. This is just a, a couple of samples of the kinds of sources that I've been drawing on. Uh, on the left, it's the, the diary of a Gurkha officer, as it happens, which is in the Gurkha Museum at Winchester. And on the right, it's a, a regimental digest. And these sources are all over the place. The, the Sikh, the, the fourth mechanized battalion of the Indian Army is the Sikh, uh, the 14th Sikh successor regiment. And the battalion still has a photograph album containing photographs and drawings from Gallipoli, which is held in the battalion. So in order to get that, my colleague in Delhi, Rana China, who's the Indian expert on this subject, uh, managed to get the, the album off the battalion, take digital images of it, thank goodness, which means they're now preserved forever. Uh, and, was able, and I've, we've been able to use it. And this is a typical page from a war diary uh, from later in the campaign. Uh, and it's legible. That's a big advance on many of the war diaries. Uh, the, most of the Gallipoli war diaries are not typed. They're, they're written in pencil, often illegible pencil. But 
to this audience, uh, they're all in, the, many of them, are, they're in all, they're, again, they're all over the place. They're in, some of them are in Canberra, but most of them are here in London in the National Archives. And if you want to go and have a look at them, you'd be very welcome. Amandeep talked about personal stories. And one of my hopes in this project was that I'd be able to gather from the Sikh community, both in India, in Britain, and in Australia, stories of Sikh men, or indeed Indians generally, who served on Gallipoli. Sadly, the only family story that I was able to gather related to this man, Nanak Sikh of the 89th Punjabis, and his grandson is a doctor in Perth, in Western Australia. Uh, and an extraordinary story of social uh, mobility, uh, from a sepoy in 1915 to a surgeon in 2014, is a remarkable rise. And TJ Singh, the doctor, had the good fortune, or the good sense, to talk to his grandfather when he was a young man and write down what his grandfather said. So in the case of Nanak Singh, we have from him uh, memories of Gallipoli, very specific memories of Gallipoli, because the 89th Punjabis, as well as the 69th Punjabis, arrived on Gallipoli on about the 1st or 2nd of May 1915, and two weeks later was withdrawn because there were allegations that its Muslim companies were unreliable. I think this is completely fatuous. I don't think they were unreliable. I think Ian Hamilton, the commander, wanted Gurkhas, and this was his way to get them. But it means that Nanak Singh's memories of Gallipoli can be located precisely to Gully Ravine and to two weeks in May 1915. And they're priceless because they are literally the only family memories that I've been able to find. And one of my hopes is that through the UK Punjab Heritage Trust, we might find more family stories, uh, which, I, which I may not be able to use for this book because I deliver it to the publishers tomorrow, but I might be able to use it for my website on Indians and Anzacs on Gallipoli. So I'm very much hoping that that, that kind of community history will come out of this kind of encounter. Uh, a word about the cost. This is a, um, a stretcher party of the 14 Sikhs, not from a medical unit. These men are from the 14 Sikhs' own stretcher bearers. I've got a feeling it's posed because the, uh, the, the casualty is lying at attention even when he's on the, on the stretcher. But it gives you, it's a reminder that they're not just fighting men, they're also men who are caring for their uh, comrades. Uh, here are some Sikh wounded in hospital in Malta. Now this is quite a contentious photograph because you'll see that the, the young man on the left has his, his, uh, his hand bandaged. And there was a great deal of contention about self-inflicted wounds among the Indian troops both in France and in Gallipoli. Uh, and I've done a, a lot of work analyzing the casualty rolls because the Indian casualty rolls, unlike the European ones, list exactly where men are wounded and, and the severity of their wounds. And for a while, I, I was tending towards the argument that there were more self-inflicted wounds in the Indian units than there were in the European ones. And I know not, I don't believe that to be the case uh, because of the, the evidence. that There are cases of self-inflicted wounds, both in Australian units and in, in Sikh and Gurkha units. But it's nothing like the epidemic that had been alleged. So it's an important bit of evidence, but it needs to be looked at in association with other bits of evidence, casualty uh, statistics and, and roles, uh, surgeons, medical officers reports. And the, the big report that was done by Sir, who was he? Seaton in 1915, that found that of 1,000 Indian casualties on the Western Front, only six of them were self-inflicted. And I think that gives us a bit of a context here. Because the thing about the, these men is, is that for the first half of the campaign at least, they were professional volunteer soldiers. Many of them in their first action, they were not veterans of war, but they were experienced soldiers, and they, they responded uh, fully to the demands that the campaign made on them. This man isn't a Sikh, of course, but he's a Punjabi. Uh, a, a drawing done by a, a British uh, sergeant called John Hargrave at Suvla later in the campaign, and he saw uh, an Indian whose leg had been blown off, shrapnel. shrapnel when a shell explodes, it sends very hot and very sharp pieces of, shot of metal. And if it slices into your leg, it will slice your leg off, and it has on this case. Um, and he described this man as sitting, waiting for a stretcher party, uh, smoking, with tears trickling down his face for obvious reasons. And that's, I think, something of the resilience that, that Indian soldiers were observed to display. One question that I was asking myself uh, when I started this project was, why are there no uh, memorials, oh, sorry, why are there no graves of Indian soldiers on Gallipoli? And of course the answer is obvious, because Sikhs don't bury, they, they cremate. And here's a photograph that shows a, the cremation in, in process of Sikh troops later in the campaign. Um, now, where did they get the wood? And I discovered the answer through the, the National Archives of India. Uh, no European, no British officer bothered to write this down. It was something that was only the concern of, of Sikh members of the unit, uh, officers and men. 
and they, they got it through the Supply and Transport Corps. The Supply and Transport Corps didn't just bring up uh, lentils and flour and, and, uh, and water, it also brought wood and it brought oil. And those two things were essential if bodies were to be cremated appropriately. So bodies that could be found and cremated were cremated, and bodies that couldn't uh, were often left out on the battlefield. But after the war, war graves parties came, and if bodies could be, identifiably, uh, could be identified as Sikh or Hindu, that is to say Sikh or Gurkha, then they were, they were cremated and the, the ashes were scattered. So the British Indian Army went to a great deal of trouble to observe the religious sensibilities of its members, and especially in, in this, this way of disposing of the dead. Um, the dead, of course, leave, in many cases, widows, and Amandeep talked about the, the widows of Indian soldiers. Here's a, a poster distributed in Britain in 1915, which asks for British help to uh, fund a charity for Muslim widows. Uh, and I'm, I don't know if there were similar uh, charities for Sikh widows, in, in, uh, widows of sepoys. Um, they were often uh, the uh, creation of British officers. Uh, British officers of Muslim regiments or Muslim units uh, were very devoted to their, to their men, and so they'd fund this. I don't know if there was a similar charity for the widows of, of Sikh sepoys, but I'd love to know. Now, I'm sorry about the, the map on the right-hand side. You have to twist your head to see it, because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't, couldn't jiggle it. But what it shows is the distribution of a sample of, of the dead of the Indian troops on Gallipoli. Uh, and just to interpret it, the, the black line that snakes through is the present Pakistan-India border. Um, Delhi is down the very bottom in the middle. And so that country between Delhi and beyond the border is, of course, the Punjab. The orangey red dots are the dead of the 14th Ferozpur Sikhs. And you'll see, of course, that they, they cluster very heavily around Ferozpur and um, Patiala. The, the other cluster, to the, just a bit to the right of that, which has got bits of green in it, green are men from the Punjabi regiments, which, of course, had Sikh companies, and they're clustering around Jolanda. The black dots are men of the um, mountain artillery, and so the black dots, which are in the Punjab, are the Sikh members of the mountain, mountain artillery, and the black dots north of the border are basically Muslim members of the mountain artillery. So the, the Indian sacrifice on Gallipoli of Indians as opposed to Gurkhas is very closely concentrated around the Punjab and especially the eastern Punjab. And that's one reason why Gallipoli isn't very well remembered in India because it relates very specifically to, to several districts. Um, I should have showed you this uh, earlier. The memorial, which I'll show you in a minute, to all of the Indian dead of Gallipoli is at Cape Hellas, uh, Hel the Hellas Memorial. It's at the foot of the peninsula. And the three areas where the Indians served are the bottom cross, that's Gully Spur and Gully Ravine, where the 14th Sikhs lost so disastrously on the 4th of June. That's the area they served in for the first two months. The middle cross is Anzac, the area where the Australians and New Zealanders landed, and that's where the mountain artillery served for the whole of their service. And then later in the campaign, the red cross at the top is the area known as Hill 60 or Demek Jelik by ear, and that's where the Indians ended, spent the last four months of the campaign. So their service in Gallipoli was very closely concentrated. Uh, the supply and transport troops served right through all of those areas. Uh, let me say a few words about Indians and Anzacs. Here's Anzacs in a train being talked to by Punjabi troops in Egypt in 1915. Both sides took a very close interest in each other. They were fascinated by, by men from other cultures and other countries. On Gallipoli, you see here, uh, this is a bivouac of the mountain artillery at a place called Pifapur. Uh, they, they made their camp at Anzac. They named it Pifapur after the Punjab Irregular Frontier Force. So it was a little bit of India in, in Gallipoli. And you'll see in the foreground there, there's a, a, an Australian, probably, sitting with a group of Indians, having his photograph taken by a New Zealander, um, and what he's doing is, is that they're, they're sharing rations, or rather, the Indians are sharing rations with the European troops. Um, the the uh, European ration, as you probably know, was bully beef and biscuit. It was a, a, a terrible ration to eat in a, a Turkish summer. The meat went all runny and the biscuits were always hard. And so the Indian troops would share dal and chapati, which is a much better diet in that climate. And many of the, the Australians and New Zealanders would drop by the Indian camp and, and get a chapati. What they do then is they would smear jam on it. And I don't think that's an appropriate way to treat a chapati. Um, 
But it means, though, that lots of Australian and New Zealand memoirs and diaries talk about their encounters with Indians. Now, this is remarkable because, as I say, Australia at the time especially was a deeply racist society in which uh, Indians were not even allowed to emigrate to Australia. Ironically, today, Indians are the fastest growing migrant group in Australia. But at that time, most Australians regarded Indians as, as being people that should be excluded from the country. And yet here on Gallipoli, this remarkable friendship developed between the two, um, to the point where uh, one of the Indians officers talked about an entente most remarkable between these two groups. Uh, and, and this book and the website that I'll create uh, documents the, the degree of that friendship. And here's an indication of that, the way in which Indians were regarded. These are illustrations done by an artist called Lionel Lindsay to illustrate um, uh, ad advertisements for Cobra boot polish. And week after week in the Australian newspapers, Cobra uh, depicted an Indian called Chundaloo from Akim Fu uh, and, and accompanied it with, a, with a, a cute little rhyme. And in 1915, Chundaloo, ridiculous name because clearly he's a, a very martial Sikh, uh, is there in the trenches with Australians. And you can see the koala bear representing the Australian with the slouch hat. And here, Chundaloo is serving with the mountain artillery. So what's happening on Gallipoli is being reflected in advertisements in Australia. And the, the troops are meeting. And here's, I mentioned that Sikh scrapbook, in, still with the 4th Mechanized Battalion in India. And here's a drawing done by Norman Wimbush, who is a, a reserve officer posted to the 14th Sikhs later in the campaign. And as you can see there, there's a Gurkha on the right, there's a, an Anzac, probably an Australian in the middle. There's a couple of Sikhs on the left. And it's depicting the, the friendships that were made in the trenches of Gallipoli. Uh, and this is reflected in newspapers. This is a, a photograph that appeared in the Sydney Mail in 1916. And as you see, there are three Australians with their hand on the shoulder of, of, a, of a Sikh, and the caption is, they're the best of chums. Um, now, you've got to allow for wartime propaganda, but the fact is that the, the, the documents created at the time also talk about the friendships. Uh, by the time the photograph appeared, two of the Australians had been killed on the Western Front. The other symbolic thing about this image is, is that if you see the face of the Sikh, it's slightly fuzzy and out of focus. And I think that's absolutely symbolic of our understanding of these men's experience because we have no diaries or letters written by Sikh soldiers. We only have the photographs of them. So we can see them, we can, we can Im imagine them, but we still don't really see them as clearly as we'd like. Can I talk about remembering for a minute, just to finish? Uh, here's a panel from the memorial at Cape Ellis, and I'll show you the memorial itself in a minute. Uh, that's one of the panels that depicts at the bottom there, you can see Patiala Infantry, and the names of them are all inscribed. Every single one of the Indians who died on Gallipoli is remembered on the Cape Ellis Memorial to the Missing. They don't have graves because of the reasons that, that they're not buried, they're cremated or, or lost, but every single one of them is named and remembered. And they're remembered on this uh, extraordinary memorial, this, this pile and at the foot of the peninsula, uh, and those panels around the memorial bear the names of all of the British and Indian and some Australian soldiers who died on Gallipoli. Uh, remembering, uh, Amandeep talked about uh, Maharaja Bhupinder Singh, and there he is, uh, with a, in a gathering of Indian veterans, Patiala veterans of the Great War, a few years after the war. So these men were coming back to their homes in the Punjab, remembering what they'd done uh, at war, and the Patiala veterans were very well rewarded. Uh, the British soldiers had very, British Indian soldiers had very poor pensions, uh, especially wound pensions, because they didn't, re they didn't revise the pension schemes until the end of the war. So if you were wounded on Gallipoli, you got a very low pension. The Maharaja of Patiala, though, uh, provided very generous pension schemes for his troops. And they're showing the loyalty, of course, that that inspires. Um, remembering. Now, through Australia, there are thousands of memorials like the one on the left in every town and most many suburbs. Uh, that's not, as you know, that's not the case in India. The Great War is not remembered in the same way. But it is in one place, and that, of course, is Patiala. And so here, just outside the new Motibag Palace in Patiala, here is a memorial to, in memory of gallant warriors. And, and not only is it a memorial to them, but as you see on the steps, that's the names of Patiala's dead. So the Maharaja of Patiala not only provided troops for the Empire's war, but remembered and rewarded them when they came back from war, or remembered them if they didn't come back. And you'll know, of course, the India Gate in, in New Delhi, which, although it only contains 13,000 13, names sorry, of Indian troops, is regarded as the, the war memorial for undivided India. Uh, and so it's one of the prime tourist attractions in Delhi. 
but I fear that many who come to see it, both Indian and, and foreign visitors, don't really know the experience that that memorial is to commemorate. And just finally, those who remembered the war. Uh, here's a group of Sikh veterans of the 14th Ferozpur Sikhs, pictured in 1945, and you can see some of the, the medals on those older gentlemen. The, the man in the middle is a, one of their British officers, Reginald Savory, who uh, is very well known in Sikh circles because he kept very voluminous records. Here's a lesson for life. If you want to be remembered by posterity, keep a diary, uh, or keep your letters, or keep photographs. And he kept all three. And so Reginald Savory is very well remembered. But in, he became a very senior officer in, in the British Indian Army, but he kept in touch with the men he'd commanded on Gallipoli. One of them, uh, Udi Singh Thandi, uh, saved his life. And for the rest of his life, Reginald Savory had a special bond with the man who'd saved his life in that battle on the 4th of June on, of uh, 1915 on Gallipoli. So there were relationships forged on Gallipoli between men. Now, final slide. Um, are Indians remembered on Gallipoli today? Well, you have to look hard to find their names on that Hellas Memorial. Otherwise, there's virtually no sign that there were 16,000 Indians who served on Gallipoli, including those 3,000 odd Sikhs. But if you go to the ferry bot terminal, the ferry port at Achabat, which is the, the, the port that links Gallipoli with Chinakli on the other side of the Dardanelles, there is an extraordinary eclectic statue. And when you park your car to get on the ferry, it's right next to you. And as you see, it, depicts on the left Ataturk at the top, the father of the Turkish nation. Uh, it depicts various figures uh, uh, related to Gallipoli, and it includes one representative of the invaders of Gallipoli, and one of them is, as you see, a Sikh. So Sikhs are remembered on Gallipoli. Uh, it's just that you have to look quite hard to find them. Now, I think I've left a bit of time for questions and discussion, and I'm really happy to hear from you, both with questions and suggestions, and especially if you have any family stories that relate to Gallipoli. Thank you very much.